Now that we have a basic understanding of the law of sines, let's add the law of cosines to our toolbox. This will help us with both the side angle side and the side 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 case for solving triangles. Here's the theorem. If triangle ABC is an oblique triangle with sides A, B, and C and angles alpha, beta, and gamma, then the first presentation of the law of cosines is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine alpha. Notice that the law of cosines is presented in three different formulas. It's not necessary to memorize all three formulas, but it is necessary to memorize the strategy or pattern behind the law of cosines. So let's examine the first formula. On one side by itself, we have the side a squared. Now, this is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides, minus two times the product of the other two sides, times cosine of the angle in between those two sides, or cosine of the angle opposite side a. This is the same pattern exhibited on the second formula. In the second formula, the side B is isolated and squared. It's equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides minus two times the product of the other two sides times cosine of the angle in between those two sides or opposite side B. The third formula follows this same pattern. The important thing to recognize in all three formulas is that the side that we have isolated and squared by itself on one side of the equation is always the side opposite the angle in the cosine. In addition, the other two sides involved in these calculations are distinct from the side we have isolated over here. Once you understand that pattern, then you really know three formulas in one. Now let's look at where the law of cosine comes from and explore the, the proof. Consider triangle A, B, C. Now notice we have two possible orientations for triangle A, B, C in the diagrams. Vertex C will be in quadrant one if angle alpha is acute, and vertex C will be in quadrant two if angle alpha is obtuse. In either case, X is equal to B cosine alpha and Y is equal to B sine alpha. Now let's pause right there just a minute and make sure where those relationships come from. If I look at this equation and isolate cosine of alpha, we can see cosine of alpha is equal to x over b. Similarly, if I look at this equation and isolate sine of alpha, we see sine of alpha is equal to y over b, one. Notice we can construct a right triangle using vertex c and the horizontal x-axis. When we do this, we can recognize that the length of this side is given by the x-coordinate x, and the vertical segment is given by the y-coordinate y. Recall from SOHCAHTOA that cosine of an angle is adjacent divided by hypotenuse. So cosine of alpha is adjacent side x divided by hypotenuse b, and that's the relationship that I see expressed here. Similarly, sine of alpha is so, opposite over hypotenuse, and that's the relationship that I see expressed here. These relationships would still be true if C is located in quadrant two with alpha obtuse. Before we begin the proof, make sure that you recognize that A, B, and C are the lengths of the sides of the triangle, and the ordered pair X, Y, once again, is the X and Y coordinates of point C. Now, the distance CB is defined to be A. It's A because it's opposite angle alpha, opposite vertex A. But we can also find the length of segment CB using the distance formula. Let's apply the distance formula to side CB. The length of side CB is equal to A, and from the distance formula, we can find the square root of the difference of the x values squared plus the difference of the y values squared. Squaring both sides of this equation, we obtain a squared equals the quantity x minus c squared, and y minus zero squared can be simplified to y squared. Recall, we can write x in terms of b and cosine of alpha, and we can write y in terms of b and sine of alpha. Plugging this information into our equation, we have a squared equals 
the quantity x, which we're going to replace with b cosine of alpha minus c quantity squared, plus now we'll replace y with b sine of alpha. And this also needs to be squared. Let's go ahead and expand that first binomial. b cosine alpha minus c multiplied by itself using FOIL yields b squared cosine squared alpha. The outside and inside terms combine to give us minus 2bc cosine alpha and the product of the last terms would be c squared. Squaring our last term, we have plus b squared sine squared alpha. Now, notice that the first and the last term contain a greatest common factor of b squared. So let's go ahead and factor it out. This gives us a squared equals b squared times the quantity cosine squared of alpha plus sine squared of alpha. I'm also going to rearrange my terms and bring this c squared to the next spot and put the minus 2bc cosine alpha at the last spot. Hopefully you recognize a Pythagorean identity here, cosine squared alpha plus sine squared of alpha equals one. So essentially we have b squared times one for that first term, followed by c squared minus 2bc cosine of alpha. And this is the familiar law of cosines. Of course, we could repeat this proof for the other lengths, b and c, but this is sufficient to establish the formula. Now, the law of cosines will be very useful in the side angle side case and also the side 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 case. To solve an SSS triangle, do the following. Number one, find the largest angle first using the law of cosines. Now, once we have applied the law of cosines, then we can find any other angle using the law of sines. The law of sines proves to be a little more convenient than the law of cosines, but the law of cosines is necessary for the side, side, side case. And then finally, find the third angle by subtracting the first two from 180 degrees. As you solve triangles, remember that the Pythagorean theorem and Sokotoa only apply to right triangles. For oblique triangles, that is, triangles other than right triangles, we'll use the law of cosines, the law of sines, and the fact that the sum of the three angles is always 180 degrees in a triangle. Now also, keep an eye on your triangle to make sure that it makes sense. The triangle inequality states, that the sum of the lengths of any two sides of a triangle must be greater than the length of the third side. So for example, let's suppose I'm attempting to construct a triangle with one side having a length of 10. Notice that if the sum of the other two sides is less than the length of the third side, then it's impossible to construct a triangle. We can see this by taking this segment that is four units in length and folding it down so that it fits right on top of the base segment. And we can do the same thing with the segment that's five units in length. Because the sum of the other two sides is less than the length of the third side, the triangle is impossible. Also remember that the side opposite the largest angle is the largest side, and the side opposite the smallest angle is the smallest side. These facts will help you to solve a uh, any triangle. Let's try the new law of cosines on example one. Our goal on both examples is to solve the triangle and we'll approximate our answers to the nearest tenth. Notice on example A, we have the side angle side case. That is, we know two sides and the included angle. To solve this triangle, we'll begin by solving for C using the law of cosine. Isolating the unknown side as C squared, this is going to be equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. That is 3.1 squared plus 2.9 squared minus two times the product of those two values, 3.1 and 2.9, times cosine of the angle in between, which is 121.3 degrees. To solve for C, we'll take the square root of both sides, and of course, we're simply going to recognize the positive root. With our calculator in degree mode, we can evaluate this in one step. We'll take the square root of 
3.1 squared plus 2.9 squared minus 2 times the product of those two values. That's 3.1 times 2.9. Finally, cosine of 121.3 degrees. All of those operations are under the radical. So we get C equal to approximately 5.2. Once again, notice we are rounding to the nearest tenth. Now, once I've applied the law of cosines to find one of the sides in the side angle side case, I can then work on finding another angle. I'm going to opt to find angle alpha next. Applying this time the law of sines, we're going to use the two values that are known, that is this angle and its opposing side, sine of 121.3 degrees, divided by 5.2 is equal to sine of our unknown angle alpha divided by its opposing side 3.1. We're going to multiply both sides by 3.1. That's going to isolate sine of alpha. Then to solve for alpha, we could apply inverse sine to both sides. So we need to evaluate inverse sine of this expression to get angle alpha. And once again, we'll round to the nearest tenth. Make sure that your inverse sign contains the entire argument in a set of parentheses. So we have 3.1 sine of 121.3 divided by 5.2. And our angle alpha to the nearest tenth would be 30.6 degrees. So alpha is approximately 30.6 degrees. So on our triangle, I'm going to label what we know. Alpha now is 30.6. The last calculation is very easy. We're going to recognize that beta can be obtained by subtracting the other two known angles from 180 degrees. Efficiently evaluating this with our calculator, we determine 180 minus 121.3 minus 30.6 gives us a value of 28.1 for angle beta. Now, the law of sines is a great way to check your calculations. Let me show you what I mean. For each angle and its opposing side, I'm going to evaluate the ratio of sine of the angle divided by the opposing side. I'll start with angle gamma and side C. I'm going to evaluate sine of 121.3 divided by the length of its opposing side, 5.2, and I'm making an observation of that ratio. Then I'm going to apply the law of sines now to side beta and B. That is sine of 28.1 degrees divided by side B 2.9. Notice it gives me the same ratio, approximately. Remember, we did approximate our solutions, so we should expect a little bit of rounding error here. And then finally, sine of alpha 30.6 divided by the opposing side A. I'm looking for the same ratio, and since we have the same ratio for sine of the angle divided by its opposing side, according to the law of sines, and all of those ratios are approximately the same, we know that we've solved the triangle correctly. Now let's look at example B. Example B is going to be the side, side, side case. Please make a correction here. Set side C to be equal to 4.5. Now on this one, we don't have the diagram constructed, so we'll have to approximate this ourselves. So we've got three sides, and they're all differing lengths. The longest side is A, the shortest side is B, and then C is in between. It looks like my longest side ended up over here, so I'm going to call this one A equal to 6.8. My shortest side is B equal to 2.4. And the middle side, the one in between those two links, we'll call C, which is 4.5. Now be careful how you name your angles. The angle opposite side A is alpha. The angle opposite side B is beta. And the angle opposite side C is gamma. In the side, side, side case, we're going to start with the law of cosines, and we want to determine the largest angle first. Remember, the largest angle is opposite the largest side. So we'll begin with law of cosines using side A and angle alpha. 
Side A has a value of 6.8. So we have A squared equals, now the sum of the squares of the other two sides would look like 4.5 squared plus 2.4 squared minus two times the product of those same two links, 4.5 times 2.4 times cosine of the angle in between, which is alpha. Now we need to solve this equation for the angle alpha. And I'm not going to evaluate the squares or the differences until the very last step. I'm gonna do one calculation with my graphing calculator that I approximate once. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract these two squared values from both sides. That's gonna give us negative two times the product 4.5 times 2.4 cosine of alpha left behind. Then to isolate cosine of alpha, I'm going to divide both sides by that product, negative 2 times 4.5 times 2.4. So we end up with 6.8 squared minus 4.5 squared minus 2.4 squared divided by the coefficient of cosine. That's negative 2 times 4.5 times 2.4. This will be equal to cosine of alpha. Now let's go ahead and isolate alpha by applying the inverse cosine to the other side. When I type this into my calculator, I need to carefully force the correct order of operations by getting the calculation in the numerator in a set of parentheses and the calculation in the denominator in a set of parentheses. So in degree mode, we can evaluate this in one step which means we're gonna round once, and this will be our most accurate answer. So notice the double parentheses. Cosine, inverse cosine automatically opens up a set of parentheses, and that then I added an additional set of parentheses around the numerator. I'm gonna close the numerator, enter my fraction bar, and open up a set of parentheses for the denominator. Now in the denominator, I'm just gonna type it as negative two times 4.5 times 2.4 and close parentheses around the denominator. And then finally, close parentheses around the argument of the inverse cosine. And we end up with 159.5 degrees to the nearest 10th. So alpha has the value 159.5 degrees. Now we can work on another angle. The next largest angle will be the angle gamma. You could certainly use the law of cosines to figure out gamma, but you might find that the law of sines is a little more efficient. So I'm gonna opt for the law of sines here. I'm gonna set this up as sine of the angle that we know, that's alpha, 159.5 degrees, divided by the opposing side of 6.8, and set this equal to sine of gamma, the angle we're trying to find, divided by its opposing side, 4.5. Now, to isolate sine of gamma, we're gonna multiply both sides by 4.5. And then, to isolate gamma, we can apply the inverse sign to both sides. So here's our calculation for gamma. Now, the argument of this inverse sign in the numerator does not need to be contained in a set of individual parentheses. And that's because the numerator is a product instead of a sum or a difference. So automatically, the calculator is going to evaluate that product using the correct order of operations. So the value for gamma looks like 13.4 degrees approximately. So gamma is approximately 13.4 degrees. Keeping up with what I know on my uh, diagram over here, alpha is 159.5 degrees. Gamma is 13.4 degrees. Then you can see that the calculation for beta will be very simple. We're gonna take 180 degrees and subtract the two other angles that we have calculated, and the leftovers will give us beta. So beta is 7.1 degrees. Now, once again, it's always a good idea to quickly check your triangle using the efficient law of sines. So I'm gonna start with sine of alpha 159.5, 
divide by the opposing side of 6.8. And I'm just going to observe the ratio. Then we'll do sine of beta 7.1 divided by side B 2.4. And finally, sine of gamma 13.4 divided by C which is 4.5. And I'm simply observing to see if the ratios are the same. They should be the same. You can expect a little bit of rounding error because we were approximating to the nearest tenth, but this is enough to build our confidence that we have solved those triangles correctly. So the law of sines is a great starting point for the side angle side and the side 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 case, but then you can always resort to the more efficient, quick, easy to use law of sines to finish solving the triangle.